Hello everybody and welcome. Um, it's a bit of housekeeping to begin with. There's no fire alarms planned, so if there's any alarms, please make your way to the nearest escape entrance. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our two presentations tonight from our guest speakers. We'll provide a unique perspective of the developments of energy storage within the Irish and international sectors. Increasingly renewable penetration has resulted in increased requirements for system flexibility. Improvements in technology, coupled with decreasing cost, has placed significant focus on energy storage, in particular battery storage as a versatile and scalable solution. John Rafferty from ESBI will focus on developments in energy storage in Ireland and the UK, applications of storage, benefits and challenges from the perspective of the asset owner, the journey of battery storage and the future outlook. Liam Brunach is CTO of Solar Energy. This is an energy storage as a service business with offices in Cork and Edinburgh. Solo business model centers on the development of a distributed demand site energy storage network to shift customers' energy supply from periods of peak demand and peak wholesale energy price to periods of peak renewable generation and low wholesale energy prices. Solo's cloud-based software platform FlexiGrid aggregates batteries within distributed energy storage network to operate as a centrally controllable virtual power plant, delivering services to electricity suppliers and system operators. Solar Energy is currently incorporating blockchain peer-to-peer -peer energy trading functionality into Flex, FlexiGrid platform using NEM blockchain platform. Just a quick introduction to the speakers. John Rafferty is an electrical engineer working in Emerging Technologies, ESB Innovation. He has over eight years experience in power systems engineering, including renewable project delivery, academia and applied research. He's undertaken the role of specialist engineer for several ESB battery energy storage projects in the UK and Ireland, including in front of the meter battery systems, hybrid battery storage and renewable projects, and pilots in the space of EV charging, battery storage and co-location and coordination. He is also chair of the ESB battery storage collaboration group. group. John graduated with a master's in electrical engineering and has a doctorate in electrical engineering from Queen's University, Belfast. Liam Bernock is CTO with Solar Energy since uh, 2017. Previously, he worked for 10 years in the power system study consultancy field at ESB International and has several years in electronics industry with analog devices. He's a chartered engineer and holds BEng in electrical engineering from UCC and has a master's in science in applied technology for technologies from Dublin Institute of Technology. So our first speaker will be John and I'd like to be all to welcome John in the usual fashion. Hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for having me here to speak. Um, so after the introduction, uh, my name is John Rafferty. Um, I work for ESB. Um, my team is uh, situated in, uh, within the strategy department of ESB and we operate as a central R&D hub for the coordination and the scouting of technologies in the space of emerging energy and research and development. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the role of battery storage uh, across ESB and the role they can play in today's grid and in the grid of the future. It's just a bit in, by way of an agenda, I suppose. First of all, I'll be talking about uh, the reasons why batteries have become so topical and so popular at the minute, and some of the challenges battery owners face. Um, then I'll take you through a brief timeline of ESB's interaction with uh, battery energy, energy storage, some of the projects that have been carried out, um, some of the projects I've not been fully directly involved in, um, and some I'll go maybe a wee bit more in, in depth to. Uh, and then I'll show you examples of batteries, um, where they're located, in front of the meter, behind the meter, uh, and as well as the future of it, and show you how different services can be applied to batteries in different locations, and how batteries are quite versatile as a technology. So, first of all, I'll talk briefly about the role of storage and th the problems facing the modern power systems. Um, the main issue is that back in the day, the electricity system was very simple. Uh, generators, uh, suppliers, and customers were all completely separate and independent to a certain extent. There was very little back, back and forth communication. Um, electricity was merely generated um, and supplied uh, upon demand, and if too much was generated, uh, it was pulled back, and if too little was generated, more was produced, and everybody was happy. Unfortunately, nowadays, uh, we've seen a massive shift towards more distributed generation, increased renewables, uh, intermittent uh, technologies such as wind and solar, and 
new emerging technologies, things like EV storage, as well as digital platforms and improved data and the change in customers have led to a system that is infinitely more complex and infinitely more difficult to remain stable uh, and to control. Um, we're also seeing unprecedented levels of non-synchronous generation, which has resulted in a system that's become slightly more volatile uh, with increasing volatility as more and more uh, components, both load and demand, are connected by power electronic interfaces. So as I said, the grid has become smarter and more complex. Data is now playing a big, bigger role, and we're seeing the change in the role of the customers at play within the industry. Uh, customers are now taking up, they're becoming active customers essentially, uh, taking on a, a prosumer role, things like micro-generation, and wanting things like greater transparency on energy usage and cost savings. We're seeing new actors within the energy market, aggregators who simply participate in the market but don't own a direct asset, and we're seeing changing roles and challenges for the system operators, uh, increasing distribution connected generations, uh, and uh, increasing in system instability uh, on the transmission side. And as a result of this, we're seeing things akin to this occasionally, which is in increasing system frequency volatility. This is an example of quite a severe event that happens on the system. Um, these events can be catastrophic uh, and can cause, you know, worst case blackouts, uh, in some cases brownouts and loss of load uh, and need to be managed. So the key is to maintain in the system of the future is to maintain flexibility, the ability to shift load and uh, shift demand and to shift generation to be more in tune with how the power system operates. Uh, and this will be the key, as I said, to maintain a stable system as we as we go forward. Um, why the focus on batteries? Uh, a picture of your man up there, um, some boy, in my opinion. Um, I think really he has done a lot personally, Elon Musk, and I know there is obviously a lot wrong with him uh, <laughs> as a businessman. Uh, but I think he. Uh, he has, uh, he's done a lot to bring battery storage to the focus and to make it, for want of a better word, sexy, which is the term I made, used when I talk about batteries. Now, batteries have become sexy uh, because of this focus. Um, it's not so much um, like an iPhone sort of example. It's more so, you know, they've they become more focal and they've become more um, a talking point, essentially. Uh, projects like the Hornsdale project there was a huge 100 megawatt scale battery delivered in a, in a series of months, you know, amazing engineering feats, um, which have done a lot to bring batteries into the public eye. But the main reason why there's such a focus on batteries really is because the costs have come down significantly. Much in the same way lead acid battery costs and performance were improved by the automobile industry taking off, the rapid uptake of EVs has led to increasing improvements in performance, in particularly in lithium ion batteries and particularly in uh, the, perf uh, the, the cost of them. Um, which has sort of made batteries now a viable option. It is more so that we're putting batteries in now because it's cost effective to do so, uh, more so than an actual sort of requirement. Um, but they are an incredibly versatile technology. You know, they are, they can be much like this, the, the Hornsdale battery. They can be incredibly scalable, incredibly quick to deploy, uh, modular design, you know, and the, the, um, they're just, um, I suppose, operationally fit for purpose, I suppose. Um, when I say operationally fit for a purpose, I suppose it depends really what the purpose is. And there's no way you could have a talk about storage uh, in Ireland today without mentioning DS3 at some point. So DS3, and I, I would not be an expert or profess to be an expert in it, but seemingly when th the combination of DS3 and storage is that as part of this DS3 program, uh, 14 services have been made available for the delivery of system services. So delivery of essentially kilowatt hours for the provision of a system service as opposed to for use by an end user. And batteries have quite an interesting place in that. Whereas pump storage has been quite, um, has been seen as quite high capacity and provides a lot of uh, system support to the Irish system as well as around the world. Um, the response time to pump storage is rather slow, circa maybe 70 seconds which puts it outside the range of, say, uh, qualifications for certain elements of frequency regulation around here. Um, but it does have the advantage of being 
uh, high energy, so up to maybe about eight hours uh, circa thereabouts. Um, of course, it's not particularly scalable. You know, we can't really flood any more areas, um, and we can't really have extensions like that. So there, there are limitations to it. Whereas flywheels are sort of the opposite. Um, they can have incredibly quick response times within that 10 millisecond range. Uh, but the problem is that their duration is quite low. So they're very high power applications, whereas the pump storage would be very high energy applications. But batteries very nicely sit in that sweet spot. They can operate on a wide range of services across that DS3, those initial reserve uh, frequency regulation and into possibly into the ramping uh, for DS3 qualifications. So it makes them a very attractive technology in that regard. But it's important to realize that batteries are versatile and it's not just the system service payment you can get from it. There are a multitude of uh, other services you can get. And it's very important that the, uh, to realize that the application of a battery and how you use a battery is dependent on how it's connected and where it's connected essentially. So here's a list of some of the services that are provided. Um, a lot of these are being looked at and discussed. Uh, energy arbitrage and frequency regulation and power factor correction of voltage support as services both for traders and for ancillary services to the grid, but also slightly more um, bespoke and localized services such as transmission and distribution, upgrade deferrals and congestion relief can also have potentially a value. Um, and it's something certainly worth investigating as well as more bespoke customer services, smart tariffs, uh, backup reserve and things like MIC mitigation. Challenges that face an asset owner, I suppose, I suppose there is maybe an issue with transparency around batteries. I suppose one of the main challenges is sizing a battery correctly. You know, batteries are quite scalable and, and quite versatile, and because of their power electronic interface, they can do quite a lot and achieve a multiple service. But it's hard to ascribe a value to each service if one has a detrimental effect on the other. So the eternal debate between the providing high power and providing high energy, <coughs> and how you mitigate that, as well as operational <coughs> concerns. Um, to avoid issues with warranty, the full capacity of a battery tends not to be used. They tend to have a minimal operation, operational range, as well as even specified the number of cycles under warranty. And uh, all of this could be, you know, I suppose warranty is key really um, to deploying this technology. And all of this needs to be factored into your business case because at the end of the day, in terms of a payment, you're really paid by the, for the kilowatt hour you deliver. And not all kilowatt hours are the same. Um, but every kilowatt hour you discharge from a battery has a degrading, has a degrading effect on the battery. Uh, and therefore, it needs to be factored into the overall business case. As well as that, how a battery is traded, you know, it is an unknown market. You know, um, seeing new issues like asset availability, because you need to see things like positive and negative frequency support, if you will, uh, as well as you know, increasingly complex systems, um, the use of intelligent platforms, and uh, just the in sheer complexity of operating a system that is so uh, unlike the traditional power system. So I'm gonna take you through a bit of a, a brief talk of uh, battery storage journey at ESB. So back in uh, 2014, uh, we first looked at battery storage, it was proposed at the time uh, between ASB and uh, a consortium of manufacturers that we would look into the development of a, of a hybrid wind battery storage system at one of our wind farms. Uh, the project did not go ahead. However, there was significant learnings on the role of lithium ion batteries in particular and also sodium sulfur batteries. And um, it certainly got ASB asking the question of battery storage and what sort of role it could play in the emerging markets. I myself was involved as the engineer on that on that project, um, so there was quite a significant amount of learning, and it was the first time I had ever sort of worked in general on on battery topics. Um, off the back of that, uh, my team in emerging technologies and R and D uh, submitted for SEAI funding to deliver a uh, behind the meter battery storage from a Tesla Powerwall in Boston Scientific, which was probably one of the first uh, Tesla Powerwalls installed in Europe at the time back in 2016. Off the back of that, we engaged with uh, aggregator Indico, who were able to develop a platform that was used to trade the battery uh, behind uh, the meter, uh, traded directly for um, frequency regulation services. 
uh, as a demand side unit under the DSM. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And off some of the learnings from the Boston Scientific Battery, we were able to swing it into in 2017, where we now have uh, Smart Energy Services, which are an energy service provider uh, within ASB who cater towards uh, industrial and uh, high load customers. And off the back of that learning, they are able to have uh, their own commercial battery solution for high end energy users in Great Britain. Um, so today, um, there's a lot of work still goes on in battery storage. Um, earlier this year, ASB um, acquired their first in front of the meter battery in the UK at Mill Farm. I'll talk a wee bit more about that later. We're also in the space of residential uh, battery storage with the Stornet and Reserve projects. Um, I'll, I'll not discuss that too much, uh, but I know the AM from Solo will be discussing that in greater detail. And we're also developing grid scale pilot battery opportunities uh, in Ireland. So behind the meter, this is the Boston Scientific Battery, which was acquired with SAAI funding uh, and supported. Um, so it's a 100 kilowatt to 180 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery as a bit of a proof of concept for how demand side management batteries would work. So behind the meter batteries um, are interesting in that they can often be co-located with predominantly a, well, a high, high use load customer or a generation customer which gives you a bit more flexibility in how you trade the battery. Um, they can operate as what's known as a demand side unit, which is essentially controlling th their, their power usage uh, to support the grid, essentially. So there may not be a requirement for additional export capacity, which is quite an interesting feature. And they can also utilize existing infrastructure. Some of the battery storage benefits, a lot of them are very customer-based, peak shaving, uh, smart tariffs and reserve. Uh, just essentially it's all boils down to arbitrage like when is when is energy most expensive uh, and how can I avoid paying that, that expense and while it's potential for uh, TSO services um, the Boston battery was able to qualify in DS3 trials for operation as a demand side unit so theoretically capable of providing frequency regulation and operating reserve services as well as potentially as an aggregator uh, traditionally you would have assumed that behind the meter installations tended to be smaller, uh, so aggregation was quite attractive then. Um, you could add a lot of capacities from a load of different sites and operate as a virtual power plant, uh, which is one potential business model. This is some of the, the uh, findings from the Boston Scientific Battery. So on your left there is uh, an actual readout from the energy management system of the battery. Where you can see circled in red is where the battery has uh, sort of lapped the peak essentially if you will uh, to provide a cheaper energy cost where traditionally you would see uh, a high energy cost in that area and it's just for the purpose of arbitrage to mitigate well, essentially um, and on the on the right is just a response to a, a frequency event regulation so capable of uh, discharging from the battery to stabilize the grid during a period of under frequency so um, I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, this is the ESB Smart Energy Services behind the meter solution. So um, currently it, it's, it's available in, in, the, in GB, essentially. Um, we engage with uh, high end load, or high use load customers to install the battery on site. Um, we pay them a fee for the connection and for the use of the land. Uh, we are able to do bespoke services for them in terms of mitigating their peaks and helping them to avoid uh, triad charges, essentially balancing out their load over the winter periods. Um, and it provides several revenue streams. And for us, we can then trade the battery uh, in the FFR market in the UK. Uh, the path to market in this instance is uh, ESB own and operate the battery and it's traded by Endico, uh, who have now become Grid Beyond uh, as the aggregator. So this is the first installed battery uh, behind the meter for SES. So it was commissioned back in 2017. Uh, there was no impact to the customer during installation. It was just a mere simple switch over of connection. Uh, the customer had goals um, to well, bolster green credentials and to improve their resilience and to optimize their energy usage, including mitigating triads and including additional revenue from demand side response. So the battery was a two megawatt 
uh, 3.4 megawatt hour battery and it was installed at the Arda glass factory. Um, Irvine in Scotland traditionally had quite a, it was quite prone to brownouts so the actual, the actual ability to provide that backup power was quite important to them as well so that's another key feature. Here's a bit more just on the, the battery facility itself so down here it looks like a little crates uh, and this is just the rendering of it here so quite an elegant modular design this was Tesla Powerwalls again um, uh, in as a series of cabinets can be kept outside for ventilation purposes sleek elegant you know pretty pretty non-invasive I suppose next um, in front of the meter storage in front of the meter storage uh, Tend, it traditionally it would have tended to be larger in capacity but there is large scale behind the meter storage options these days so that you can't really make that distinction so in front of the meter storage is essentially any storage that is not co-located directly with the load or co-located directly with generation so it's purely depending on a, a grid connection and as such the charging and discharging of the battery is purely dependent on the kilowatt hour of the market price and the availability of the battery so it does require import and export capacity, and therefore it does require additional infrastructure. So it's really purely a trading tool as opposed to a customer service tool, if you consider it like that. Uh, some of the benefits of in front of the meter battery storage, battery, battery owners and operators can compete in all the regular markets, arbitrage, capacity mechanism, and the system services market. Uh, because it's not a DSM unit, it can trade for additional features for, for the, within the TSO. Uh, so there is the potential for a greater variety of service. Um, so the TSO and DSO uh, bespoke services such as potentially DS3 services, congestion relief uh, for the TSO, localized voltage support uh, and infrastructure deferral for the DSO. Again, these would be some of them dependent on location and depend on the power system and it can be rather difficult to identify the value of things like that. Uh, again, it can also be capable of being portfolio traded. This is the Mill Farm uh, battery. Uh, it was developed as a proof of pilot concept and it's ESB's first in front of the meter battery storage system. It's in Lincolnshire. Um, it's a seven megawatt, seven megawatt hour lithium ion, lithium ion phosphate battery, I believe. Uh, and it was delivered by EPC uh, solar and storage developer Anesco, who I believe of 80 megawatts roughly of storage, similar storage assets delivered in the UK. Uh, the battery was provided by Chinese battery manufacturer BYD. They were one of the world's largest. Uh, it, 17 years, I believe, of battery storage experience. And it's traded on the GB market by aggregator Line Jump. So, the Mill Farm battery, um, as I say, is the first of its kind for ESB in, in front of the meter uh, battery storage assets. Um, it is a pilot in that it's considered by ESB as an investment in flexible assets and uh, their operations, as well as getting uh, general uh, experience on how to deliver and how to maintain and how to operate a battery storage system like this. Uh, it's provided significant learnings and it's operating currently now in, the, in, a, in a more mature UK market and it's, it's hoped that those learnings and applications can then be applied or tailor fit to or towards the emerging Irish market. However, it is not just um, a proof of concept pilot, it's also being traded and is currently being traded in the, in the energy, in the balancing and in the system service market. So, a bit more about uh, market shift. Um, as I mentioned previously, the frequency and reserve markets are quite well tailored to battery storage. Uh, they can respond within 100 milliseconds for a duration up to four hours, um, which makes them quite ideal. However, the actual reserve market is quite shallow. Um, we're not entirely sure what sort of size it is, um, but if you're essentially trying to build a storage asset business case, based off purely those two markets, it, it can be increasingly difficult. However, we're seeing an increasing shift towards high energy uh, and away from high power, I suppose. Uh, we're seeing new markets under ISM intraday trading in 15 minute periods in the balancing market could favor storage durations that last longer 
hours, uh, who knows, potentially days, which have sort of existed maybe outside what's fully commercially proven for lithium ion batteries. We're seeing a bit more of the shift already uh, in GB. GP uh, have imposed a capacity derating uh, for batteries shorter than one hour uh, with an 80% capacity derating, which is quite significant. Uh, I must stress that this applies only to in front of the meter installations, so standalone batteries, and does not apply to behind the meter batteries, which are considered DSM. This might all sound like not great news for batteries. However, uh, despite the frequency regulation market being shallow, the ability and the versatility of batteries to be stacked as a service, as well as to be modularly increased, uh, have lent itself to potentially viable business cases, um, provided that they are flexible enough to deal with more of the high energy usage. So there could be a market shift towards longer duration batteries, uh, but as well as having the capability to provide those, those fast response services. So in this uh, field, ESB is doing quite a lot. Um, myself and <clears throat> Emergent Technologies have, have looked and have worked quite closely with the business units to further develop business opportunities for storage in these emerging markets. Uh, and we're also doing a lot of technology scouting and development of actively investigating longer duration storage technologies, which may not necessarily be lithium. Although at, at this stage, it seems like lithium is quite a firm place as the market leader for uh, static storage, so we don't know what kind of market shift it might take to do that. But there are potentially other <coughs> technologies at play. Technologies like flow batteries, uh, sodium sulfur batteries, and metal air could all have a place in the market, and it's important not to become uh, technology islanded. So for the future of battery storage, <coughs> I think a lot of it can be in co-location. Uh, co-location has a lot of benefits in general because it utilizes a lot of existing infrastructure. And where we sort of see, two of the areas we kind of see batteries uh, become quite prominent is co-location with generation sites and co-location as part of EV charging hubs. So as I discussed uh, previously, uh, high levels of increasing penetration of intermittent renewables, 60 to 65% non-synchronous generation, uh, can, happens routinely enough in Ireland. And there's aims to increase it 75, possibly even up to 90%. Uh, if possible. Uh, and also there's a new requirements under ISM uh, in terms of balancing and in terms of a re a re sort of focus on the idea of renewable farming and support. Um, the benefits, I suppose, really of, of a battery at, at a storage site, as well as the shared infrastructure benefits are, it can also provide a couple of bespoke services. As minimizing balance and payments, uh, you can be more at play with arbitrage if you're if you're a high-end generation user, you have different options for charging and discharging depending on uh, market cost a kilowatt. And things like curtailment mitigation could technically be possible. Um, I think for a figure I, I, I was quoted there, 1% of the total watt hour demand 2016 was actually curtailed, uh, which can be quite a sizable amount of energy that seems to seemingly wasted. What ASP is doing, Again, myself and the TIU and the business units are uh, developing these business models for co-location of storage and renewable generation. Uh, there are a lot of regula regulatory issues and technical issues that need to be overcome. Uh, and ESB has ongoing work and participation in regularly working groups for hybrid systems like this. Um, we're also investigating pilot opportunities within that space. Uh, EV charging, um, again, rapid uptake of EVs in recent years. Uh, and we're seeing an exponential growth in EVs as a whole. Uh, we're seeing a faster and faster charging, high power DC charging of 150 kilowatts, potentially higher, uh, but only for short durations of 15 minutes, um, which is a very interesting load to see on a power system. Uh, and it can be incredibly difficult to manage such a load when you don't exactly know where it's going to appear or when it's going to appear. And it can be incredibly intermittent. Uh, you would think with the high power requirements, this would be quite suited to batteries. Uh, and it can provide a lot of, again, bespoke services, smart tariffing and uh, minimize connection costs, as well as some of the more traditional battery usage, uh, customer services and uh, congestion relief uh, and so forth. Um, the issue with the, the, the battery is that to operate a battery and an EV charging station of high capacity is that 
you're not always guaranteed there is a load or you have no idea of the actual load profile. So to use a battery to mitigate that load can be quite difficult. So there are certain challenges in there. But um, what ASB are doing then is as the owner and operator of the EV charging infrastructure in Ireland and in regions of the UK, we are quite well positioned to investigate these EV and battery storage uses. And myself in, in TIU and uh, eCars as well as uh, SES are actively <coughs> investigating the potential for pilots in this space uh, of uh, fast EV charging and battery storage. So just going to wrap it up here with a few conclusions. Um, flexibility is the key to maintain system stability. As we increase renewables and as the load becomes more variable and more actors begin to play in the energy markets, uh, the ability to control your output, um, be it your load or demand, becomes incredibly key uh, to ensuring that the lights stay on. Battery storage is a versatile technology, uh, very capable of providing multiple services. Uh, has been commercially implemented and proven in a lot of uh, services. However, the markets are still evolving and it's important to keep an eye on that and to adapt as the market changes. Uh, data trading and the use of digital platforms will become more of a player uh, as the grid complexity in increases and they can have a, play, a large play in how batteries are managed, uh, how they provide a service and how the business case is formed. And finally, it's like said, the SBR currently developing these energy storage across all these aspects of the business. And I myself work in an area that is very focused on storage. We see it uh, filtering into all facets of the business from residential to grid scale. And although batteries as in and of themselves will not provide the answer to flexibility, they can certainly play a key role in it. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I appreciate that. We'll hold questions for John Alton afterwards, and I'd like now to welcome Liam Bernock from Solo. Thanks, Nick. Uh, oh, uh, that, was, that was great, John. Uh, done a lot of the hard work for me. Um, I've been told I can't move away from the podium because of the webcast, which I'm really, really going to struggle with, so apologies. Uh, it's nice to see so many familiar and friendly faces here, at least I hope they're friendly anyway. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm CTO with Solo Energy for the last couple of years. Um, prior to that, I was at ESB myself. Um, I'm going to give you a flavour of what we do as a company, um, more towards the domestic market. So while there, were, while there might be some overlap of what, what John was talking about, uh, I'll try and keep that overlap to a minimum. So... Um, Solo, our motto is the best way to predict the future is to create it. Um, we absolutely believe in a 100% renewable vision, 100% uh, renewable future. Uh, and we're helping to create that future by, by building a virtual power plant based on, on battery storage, based on energy storage. Uh, but our focus is more domestic and small business. So we're talking about uh, residential batteries, vehicle to grid chargers um, to control electric vehicles. Uh, we optimize the operation of those assets centrally from, from the cloud, from our uh, FlexiGrid platform, and we're also integrating a, a blockchain peer-to-peer -peer trading layer as well. Uh, everyone here would be familiar with uh, increasing renewables on the system. It's undoubtedly a great thing, but it does pre present, uh, or present certain challenges for the system operator. Um, and as those renewables continue to increase and inter intermittency of generation continues to increase, uh, we do see that uh, energy storage must play a part in the solution. It's not a panacea, as John said, but it has to be there as part of the mix. Also on that note, uh, battery prices uh, have significantly decreased in the last few years, and we see that trend continuing, uh, especially with the Chinese manufacturers ramping up uh, production. Uh, with the net effect, certainly for our, our business model, is that we will see uh, home storage systems becoming commoditized pretty quickly. Uh, a number of different uh, or, uh, other elements to this is that the, the, the standard utility model or, or electricity supplier model is changing. Um, <coughs> it needs to move away from a, you know, a charge per kilowatt hour basis to, to something that's more of a service-based model. 
Um, and this is no small part precipitated by a number of key tipping points on the horizon, one of which is the grid cost parity of non-utility solar cost storage. Uh, so a large scale defection from the grid could happen, for example. So uh, what we're looking to facilitate is a move away from the traditional system of uh, a mix of uh, fossil fuels or preferably renewable generation supply and demand, uh, a unidirectional system to one that's more bidirectional. So using that renewable generation to uh, you know, charge batteries at, at the domestic premises, um, using local generation as well, maybe on your roof uh, to charge those batteries and also supply uh, the the power requirements to charge uh, to charge EVs as well, um, and then by controlling uh, those assets in a coordinated fashion to allow uh, those assets to actually help the grid at certain times, or even provide energy to your neighbour, for example, through a peer to peer um, type environment. So there's a, a few key enablers in this space, uh, certainly for our model. Um, and there's, there's good momentum in certain markets in this area. A key enabler is, well, first of all, you, you do need to revenue stack uh, to make the model work, as, as John said. And to revenue stack, you need access to diverse markets. So um, one of which is the grid services uh, element. Uh, another is the balancing mechanism. So that's the more within day mechanism that the system operator uses to, to balance the grid. Um, and other kind of markets like arbitrage and so forth, uh, you need access to those markets. Um, infrastructurally, at, uh, while CNI customers have been smart metered effectively for a long, long time, smart metering hasn't been there for domestic level, certainly not in, in the Irish and UK markets uh, up to now. Um, however, UK have made some significant progress in this regard in the last few years. There's about 8 million smart meters now uh, in the UK. Um, but you also need the back-end processes. So it's all well and good being able to capture what's happening behind the meter in terms of the real data, but you need to be able to settle that customer based on the real data on the market. So you need the, the back-end processes, and Alexon have that in, in the UK. The, they're the uh, balancing and settlement code operator in the UK. Unfortunately, in Ireland at the present time, we, we have neither the smart metering infrastructure nor the back-end processes to facilitate that. It will come, but it's not there quite yet. So our, our business model is to deploy batteries and vehicle to grid charges ac across the grid to centrally control these uh, in a distributed, or sorry, a, a coordinated fashion and to uh, facilitate that, that increase in uh, local renewable, renewable generation. Um, we partner with energy suppliers, so we go to the customer uh, as, as a combined offering with the energy supplier, 100% renewable uh, supply, not greenwashed through regos or anything like that, uh, backed up by actual PPA contracts, power purchase agreements with actual renewable generating plant. Um, and our, our, our model is effectively just to lower the customer's bills. So you let us do all the optimization, all the control and everything, all you're gonna see is a, a reduced bill. How uh, we access revenue is through a, a variety of means. One is the grid balancing services that again, John has, has talked about in depth. Um, interesting developments in that recently in the UK for the domestic market, the, the first instance of a provider with domestic load within their portfolio, so they're actually using batteries again, uh, being offered or successfully awarded, I should say, uh, a fast frequency response contract uh, by National Grid. Oh, it happened only last month. So very, very big development in that space. Um, electricity suppliers, what we do is we, we reduce their cost of supply. So uh, we manage their imbalance position. We reduce their use of system charges, so what they pay to the system operators for effectively for using the grid at certain times a day to provide energy to consumers um, and also um, our, uh, minimizing their wholesale costs where we can as well. And the wholesale market is essentially an arbitrage play effectively. So this is, this is our flexi grid platform at a high level. So every home or, or, or business has, a, has a, an asset there, whether it be an electric vehicle uh, facilitated by a vehicle to grid uh, charger 
or a, a battery, a static battery uh, sitting there. We pull all that data up into the cloud where our, our platform is based, um, perform some data analytics, take in grid signals, uh, take in some pricing signals from the market, and also bring in some of our forecasting element in terms of demand and, and pricing as well. Um, crunch the numbers, run some algorithms effectively, and, and push a, a charge discharge profile down to the network, um, basically optimizing the use of the whole network. This is a little bit of further detail uh, about our platform. So as I said, it, it incorporates a monitoring and a data analytics layer. Uh, the decision engine is the brain, basically. It takes all the, the disparate data in uh, and effectively makes the decisions um, and issues that to the runtime environment, which is effectively like a dispatch engine, for, for want of a better word. On the left, you'll see the various battery manufacturers we've worked with to date, uh, also vehicle to grid chargers and uh, system operators as well. Um, I will make one correction actually on, on your presentation, John. The power wall is the, is the residential battery, power pack is the, the, the bigger scale battery for commercial and industrial applications. But various manufacturers in there, including Tesla, uh, South Korean, LG Chem, BYD, Chinese manufacturer, do grid scale as well as John said, but also do domestic. Uh, and pair Spanish manufacturer, Nissan, who you all know, and, and the market leader, well, maybe uh, between LG Chem and Zanin, uh, the, one of the market leaders, uh, Zanin, uh, German battery manufacturer. And uh, yeah, so that, that's essentially a little bit more detail on, on the FlexiGrid platform. So the optimization process is all about effectively re uh, reacting to the best price signals. You know, nothing more complicated than that. We are very much a play more in the near term, not long term out. Um, where we do have some element of maybe a bit longer term is where we procure um, a, a contract with the system operator, be it a local system operator, and there's lots of those markets have opened in the UK, uh, or transmission system operator, um, to provide flexibility services. So we, we have to uh, reserve that capacity effectively to be uh, to be able to deliver when we're called upon. Um, but as we get closer to, to more time of delivery, uh, so day ahead, intraday, and, and within the settlement period, you're looking at uh, you know, things like arbitrage, uh, managing the, the suppliers, the electricity suppliers in balance position, what they've forecasted they will do versus what they're actually doing. So this is, this is essentially how the decision engine works. We have a, a generation and demand forecast for each of our sites. We bring that in with, along with some, some other uh, data, like what is the makeup of the network, what is the state of charge, how many times a battery, a particular battery has been cycled over its lifetime, because um, that's a big element. It's, it's about managing that portfolio as a whole. You want to distribute the load, load equally. Uh, and taking other stuff like a uh, grid service. Are we contracted to be able to provide a big service, a uh, grid service, I should say, um, at peak time? We've got to make sure that we have enough capacity to do that. And also wholesale market uh, signals as well. And as we get closer and closer to real time, we just constantly optimize that and refine that, um, that portfolio and even override it if there's an opportunity. So this is what a, a typical charging profile may look like. So. Domestic premises, um, standard low profile, you know, peak in the morning, peak in the evening, uh, valley in the middle of the day. Uh, let's say they have solar PV, a little bit of excess in the middle of the day, that'll top up the battery. We determine the, the optimum time to charge, which is a lot of the time is, is at night, but it can be during the day as well. Um, when use of system charges are low and wholesale prices are low, uh, basically we want to take that customer off the grid as much as possible during the day and also leave some capacity to actually play in the, either the wholesale market or, or supply a grid service. See, these are, are, are various projects we've worked on over the last couple of years. Uh, Reflex up in Scotland, Orkney is an interesting place, I can elaborate a bit more on that in a minute, a 30, 30 home housing development in Scotland. Uh, John teed me up for Stornet, uh, so I better speak about that a little bit, I suppose. That's a collaborative project with ESB Networks, Electric Ireland, ourselves, and the International Energy Research Centre in Cork. Um, 
rolling out basically 20 home uh, or rolling out 20 batteries in 20 homes uh, in the Ballyferret or a, a area of the Badingal Peninsula. And essentially what we're doing there is is um, delivering grid services back to USB networks so that's primarily voltage support but also demand response as well. Uh, eStore which was an SEI funded project as well, the SEI are, are active in this area um, as John said as well and uh, freed uh, an interreg funded project. So various different projects, different objectives out of each, but uh, a lot of uh, crossover. In terms of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, there's a lot, there's a long way to go in from a regulatory perspective. Um, but essentially what we are looking to do is basically a more, a, for, a more fair and equitable system. If you have excess, you get paid a little bit more for that excess and the person that maybe you're selling energy to they they pay a little less for the energy they're they're paying while at the same time making sure that the grid gets paid for it's got to be paid for right so you can't have people benefiting from the access to the grid and not paying for it but essentially so in the UK for example at the moment uh, if you export to the grid you get paid four pence a kilowatt hour uh, th that is going actually in April it will be zero um, for new installations it goes up all the way through all those processes, um, some inefficient, some very well justified, and comes back down and may go to your neighbour at 15 pence a kilowatt hour. And all we want to do is maybe give a little bit more to the guy who's exporting and uh, take a little bit off the guy who's, uh, who's um, you know, importing. So this is essentially how it works. Is um, It's a smart contract-based system, so it's, it's effectively just computer code that automatically um, processes the transactions based on a certain set of criteria. You geostamp, you timestamp, and you, um, you volume stamp the, the transaction effectively. Uh, this is a, a demo that we, we undertook in, uh, in, uh, on our project in Scotland, so I really wish I could walk over here now. But uh, effectively, you'll see in the center there, um, one battery is set to discharge and at the same time uh, the battery in the adjacent premises is set to charge. Um, a little bit clearer here, same kilowatt hour uh, value and at the same time uh, an automated transaction is processed using the, the NEM smart asset um, blockchain solution. So it's a uh, yeah, um, real-time blockchain settlement of, of the transaction. This is Purely but from a technical perspective, you have to overcome a lot of regulatory barriers here to actually settle that on, on, on the market. Um, but there has been very positive noises from Ofgem again and uh, Alexon in the UK again, particularly Alexon have uh, produced a white paper recently on enabling domestic customers to actually procure energy from multiple suppliers. So an, an example of that would be your EV comes with the energy uh, as part of the contract. So you could potentially have an electricity supplier for your home and an electricity supplier for your EV. Might get confusing, but uh, there is ways of, of making that work. Uh, that is a key facilitator to to peer to peer. Uh, just a little bit of information: it's a security token offering we're launching in early 2019. Essentially, this is there to to uh, to fund a large scale rollout of uh, of our VPP. Um, prior to bringing in a financing solution. And uh, we're working with uh, EY, one of the big four on that in terms of legal and regulatory uh, perspective. So that's, that's about it from, from me. Um, I suppose in general, uh, again, as John was saying, what you're seeing is uh, improving technology at a lower cost. Market access has suddenly started to open up in the last couple of years. Some of those grid services you couldn't get access to a couple of years just, just because of the technical requirements. What that has meant is that some, however, some of those markets, the prices have been cannibalized, you know, uh, they were shallow markets effectively. As soon as high volumes came in, it, it dropped the price right down. Um, things like the balancing mechanism has been opened up to aggregators. It's the first time ever, it traditionally wasn't. Uh, that'll be from April of next year in the UK. Uh, the Great Britain market is seeing significant momentum Ireland will follow and there's different applications here certainly DS3 is a, is a, is a big uh, is a big one uh, from our perspective our pilots and our work to date has, has led to our first commercial offering in the UK and 
uh, Italian with our, our first uh, supplier, Our Power, uh, Scottish based supplier. We've been immediate pipeline of 500 units in early 2019, and we're using that STO to effectively fund out a much larger scale rollout after that. So that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs> So we'll open the floor to questions now for both John and Liam. So, um, so yeah, so you're just act asking about Asking about the comms, uh, yeah. essentially, so whether you have a device down on at the home or or, or, um, or can you just cloud to cloud, as you said. So, um, a couple of different options. So, our um, our model is always about being agnostic. We don't want to tie ourselves to any particular hardware or, or any different or particular communication solution. We have two different options. One is we're communicating to the to, to the devices using either a local API or a server level API. And the second is actually we have a device, um, well, the local API would use a device down locally, but uh, you have a device down that has hardwired comms back to the batteries as well. So it depends on the manufacturer. It depends on the application. The, the applications where we've traditionally used um, a device uh, down at that level is is has been more uh, larger applications, you know, uh, commercial applications. For your typical homeowner, uh, we go over the broad broadband of the customer's home, um, and we ping this either the manufacturer's server, uh, or we actually sit down there and we actually communicate the device via that local application programming interface. So, a couple of different solutions, basically. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so for, I suppose it's important to state for our, our model is about um, deploying that asset at no upfront cost to the, the homeowner. A, a typical homeowner, if they were go, to go out and do that and they're, and they're off their own bat, and it is, I'm not going to skirt the question, I'll give you an answer at the end, but it is difficult uh, to say because it depends on, you know, do they have generation on site? What's their load uh, profile look? Do they get any export payments? So obviously not in Ireland and so forth, but you are looking towards the warranted lifetime of the battery. So you're looking nine, 10 years or, or possibly more depending on the market. So it's a long payback for um, an individual customer to go out and do this at the moment. Yeah. Sorry guys, uh, there's people joining on the webcast, so we'll just ask you to use the mics for the questions just so that the people joining can hear. Thanks. Hi, thanks. And then for yourselves, you're anticipating much uh, shorter payback periods yeah, than nine or ten yeah, years. Yeah. yeah. Now a lot of the, a lot of the markets are merchant markets, so you have to secure contracts in them, or you have to, you know, it's all about optimizing your your, um, uh, you know, interaction with those markets. But yeah, you're talking a couple of years time frame, or, or, or you know, in that two to four year time time bracket. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Hey, I'm trying to come kind of, uh, uh, with EY. Um, question, Liam, for the, uh, I guess, with the, the batteries, like if he set up a kind of a virtual plant across a, an entire area, would you be, or what's your concern around kind of the lifespan of those batteries and kind of your exposure then if he set up, a, if he contract into the market within a certain capacity and then kind of those batteries start failing at a, or don't have the lifespan? Kind of that they might have originally the manufacturer might have originally thought yeah so the it, it's a very good question uh and their different chemistries lend themselves to to different cycling so with certain chemistries you can you can cycle the batteries much more regularly uh, with no little or no degra degradation uh, certainly much lower degradation profile other chemistries 
that will degrade the battery m much more quickly. Um, so as I alluded to, in terms of operating them, it's a portfolio management perspective. You want to make sure that you keep the, the level of cycling roughly consistent across the batteries. You also want to keep that, that range that you charge them and discharge them uh, in, um, you know, within its optimum level. But it's, it's, uh, it's about managing that process on an ongoing basis. In terms of, um, we've good data and with the batteries we've used to date, uh, and also, you know, um, some very good information out there from manufacturers uh, in terms of their tests over long-term processes. But there is an element of trust as well. Obviously, you, if you're provided with a piece of hardware, it, it should do what it's warranted to do as well. So there is an element of trust there. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to comment that it's good to see somebody doing something real in the peer-to-peer -peer trading space, yeah. that there's been quite a lot of hot air, let's say, as regards to potential for in energy markets, so it's good to see a, a real business endeavor there. Uh, my question would be regarding, you, ma you made a comment on Regos. Um, mm. Could you elaborate on what you would see the distinction between, uh, electri say, green, is green supply based upon Regos and what, what you're offering and how you're going to create a brand distinction there and my other question would be uh, how do you know that uh, let's say your signals to consumers might not be fighting with either the distribution operators uh, endeavors to to manage the network or, or the transmission system operators endeavors yeah um, so first uh, on the first point uh, when I was alluding to to Regos what I was really getting at there is that uh, currently uh, a supplier in, in, in various juris jurisdictions, we're not going to use the UK as an example again, they can, they can buy those renewable certificates effectively uh, off the market at low prices and uh, present their, their um, solution as, as a hundred, or their offering as 100% renewable, um, where it's not actually, you know, uh, they're not directly, they don't have any direct interaction with that, uh, that generator you know um, I would see a, a more um, valid renewable supply being where the electricity supplier contracts through a PPA with that renewable generation so y you could potentially in some cases in the UK a small supplier could you know uh, effectively pretend that or present it that they have a hundred percent renewable supply at a cost of only maybe additional cost of 30 40 50 thousand through purchase of those regos, so that that's what I was uh, referring to there. And uh, if you want to follow up, yeah. And are you endeavouring to make a brand distinction on that basis? And is it attractive to let's say customers? Yeah. Uh, yeah oh yeah. Sorry. The so the the question was whether we want to make a uh, a distinct brand, you know, or a brand distinction uh, because we're using one hundred percent renewables. But so it's it's more that we're partnering with suppliers who've already made that brand distinction. Uh, and there are a lot of offerings in the UK in this market. So Bull, for example, 100% renewable supply, Our Power, 100% renewable. So there, there seems to be a growing appetite for it. Uh, would I say the mass market uh, is driven by this? No, most people are driven by a cheaper, a cheaper tariff, uh, you know, a lower cost. Um, I've actually forgotten the second question. I apologize. Oh yeah, yeah, operators. yeah, yeah. So in terms of uh, the system operators, that in can be a challenge, particularly I would say locally. Uh, you, you'll see local issues more before you start to see wider issues. So for example, uh, a line where you might have uh, poor voltage performance and stuff. But if you're operating in a coordinated, coordinated manner, you can actually help the grid locally there as well. So. Uh, there's sufficient capacity to, to you know <coughs> build up to a certain level without having a material impact on the grid but beyond that it needs to be done in a coordinated fashion i will actually say one thing on on the peer-to-peer -peer space as well i should clarify that we have absolutely no interest in doing anything involved in proof of work uh, uh, consensus mechanisms which are uh, a, a drain on the energy system uh, you know um, the consensus mechanism we use uh, through NEM is a proof of importance which is very energy efficient and it's 
it doesn't have this big mining drain that you see like Bitcoin and, and so forth as well. So that's it's important to stress that point. For John, um, you both uh, were very much focused in the UK, and you mentioned Liam that in the UK the regula the regulator was being quite positive. Um, John, you mentioned working groups in terms of the regulator. How do you see the Irish market in that regard? Um, I suppose it's a it's a it's a difficult question, really. Like uh, y you know, uh, I suppose that's why we have working groups in general. Uh, you know, the, I suppose the Irish market can follow suit to a certain extent or can certainly take learnings from the UK market. But it's also important to consider that the Irish market is very different from the UK market in just the way it's set up. You know, the UK is quite well interconnected uh, with the rest of Europe and it has that robustness, whereas Ireland, Ireland is an island on its own, essentially with two points of connection, uh, unprecedented levels of non-synchronous generation. So it can't necessarily be treated in the same way but it's certainly uh, there are learnings that can be taken from that um how exactly that's going to plan out is it's i it's as difficult to say at this stage i suppose i suppose from my own perspective i would say it's important to to note the achievements that we've made in, in ireland to date like the, i think the ds3 program is incredible yeah uh, i don't think uh, airgrid or esb networks uh, get the credit they deserve for that uh i'm speaking specifically uh, purely from uh um, a vested interest point of view when I'm talking about domestic you know uh, and we are further away from that here but that's because we haven't implemented a smart metering infrastructure program that's because we haven't had a big P, um, solar PV rollout you know that has driven kind of the interest in this space and some countries has created issues that solar mm. PV rollout as well so a lot of these models are addressing those issues so it's not that I don't think that we're not doing anything innovative and, and the regulators and supportive and the system operators aren't doing their job because I do think they're doing an incredible job. It's just, it's it's different market and, and things have happened at a different time in, in our space, in, in, in Ireland. That's, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, yeah, this is uh, probably more a question for John, but um, I was thinking, um, would you guys kind of foresee uh, a more integrated uh, energy system in Ireland in the future where it would be sort of um, the electrical grid, you know, kind of connected to like a heating grid, kind of like they have in Denmark? Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, actually, yeah, the electrification of heat and the electrification of transport as well. Um, they're going to play a crucial role in the grid of the future and you know i suppose it's is it one of one animal driving at it is this this need to decarbonize uh which is is obviously quite prevalent across ireland and across europe um esb certainly see uh the electrification of heat and transport as vital to uh the system essentially like and vital to meeting those low carbon goals and it's definitely something that's to be considered and sort of as I alluded to in my own presentation, you know, you're going to see these uptake of EVs and you're going to see the electrification of more things. It becomes less uh, tangible assets. It, well, sorry, that's the wrong word. Uh, there becomes less um, of the traditional assets, traditional heavy rotating mass, and it becomes more moving into a digital and a more involved with power electronics and the issues that that presents for the system. And we think storage can help to overcome those issues to a certain extent. Um, but obviously, there's a, a lot of it is is management and data and uh, control. So uh, yes, absolutely. That's what we had. That was a uh, uh, sorry. Uh, would you kind of see more scope? Like I know, kind of ter thermal storage. I guess is further down the line than than batteries are at the moment. And you know, I guess as a result, they're about five percent of the cost. Would you see kind of scope in the interim to use? them as a method to yeah i think as liam sort of said balance. you know there needs to be an element of technology agnosticness like um because if you like every 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 different technology including thermal storage including things <coughs> like hydro including uh compressed air including flywheels 
they can all play their place within the system and i i certainly don't think that batteries are the are the fix all technology that will cure all system stability issues but i think they can play quite a large role but they do need to be coupled as you say with other long-term storage and other more much like in the way we've diversified a generation mix uh, in terms of renewables we'll need to diversify storage in the same way And I'd just like to add, in the new year, we will have um, an event, hopefully, about the ESV strategy to a low-carbon future. So it might be of interest to people here as well, and we'll deal with a lot of those topics. OK, so I think we'll draw tonight's event to a close. I'd just like to thank Liam and John very much for a very interesting, informative uh, lecture, and invite you all to thank them in the usual manner. <laughs>